Once again, thank you very much for joining with me on the Side by Side. I want to take you on a, a daily walk for a little while. As you know, we're in the middle of this present lockdown. And it means that we're allowed to go for our medicine, for our shopping, for our essential work, and we're allowed to go for daily exercise. So I was thinking that we could be going for our daily exercise together. You may not be able to get out, but come with me and I hope I'll take you some places and show you some things that might be an encouragement to you. We began by walking along the countryside and we saw the tree beside the river on our first day. Yesterday we had a look at the plowman who was plowing in the field. Now, if you can just capture in your imagination and lift up your eyes a little bit, you might see in the distance a little number of little white dots scattered on the hillside. The scattering of the white dots at first looks like just a piece of the general colour, but as we get closer to it, we can begin to make out the shape of the animals, of the sheep on the hillside. Sheep all year out there, winter and summer, and we often don't even notice that they're there. And yet, it's interesting, when you come to the Bible, you realise how important the idea of the shepherd and the sheep really is. In Luke chapter 15, we read about Jesus being challenged and perhaps rebuked by the, the religious people of his day. Listen to what it says. Now the tax collectors and the sinners were all gathering around to hear him. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law muttered, This man welcomes sinners and eats with them. Then Jesus told them this parable. Suppose one of you has a hundred sheep and loses one of them. Does he not leave the ninety-nine in the open country and go after the lost sheep until he finds it? And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. Then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my lost sheep. I tell you that in the same way there is more rejoicing in heaven over the sinner, one sinner who repents, than over ninety-nine righteous persons who do not need to repent. You may remember that it's part of a group of parables that Jesus tells about the lost being found. And of course, there are all sorts of things have been said about the sheep. I know that it seems to you and I something we, we may be foreign to our personal experience. You're neither maybe a shepherd, nor have you any interest in it. And it may make you wonder, well, if you've got 99, why would you be bothered about one? And yet, isn't that one of the things that comes across in this passage? That the one sheep really did matter. Not just the one sheep, but every one mattered. And Jesus is explaining to his these critics around him just why he behaves and acts in the way he does. And that's why he uses a parable, a story that, that they can understand, because this is exactly the way they would think. And what he's saying to them is, if you would go after your lost sheep, how much more would I not go after lost people, lost souls? I'm conscious that when I'm out for a walk, sometimes I see a photograph up stuck along, on, a, on a telegraph pole or on a lamppost where somebody has put a picture of their dog or their cat. It's usually a cat. They're the ones who may get lost or go away for a few days and, and maybe people are very concerned. Now, I'm not personally a cat lover, though I can fully appreciate for those who are that an animal that is precious to them, they would be willing to go searching and seeking until they would find it. And you then maybe understand a little bit about the way Jesus is trying to convince and convey these to these people just how important his mission is. Think about the preciousness of lost souls to Jesus. When he talks about going and searching, you know, into the open country, and he goes after the lost until he finds it. You know, there is a sense in which we can go out looking and then we give up. And many people have their limit for looking and searching for lost things. But there is no limit to the Lord Jesus searching for lost souls. 
I think this says to you and I, if you know yourself to be found by Jesus, if you know yourself to be his child, it means that you must have been precious to him. And the reason why you can call him your saviour today is because that he has gone to search for you. Now, I don't think that just means what we've been thinking about at Christmas, that love came down at Christmas, as the carol says, that Jesus came searching and that's part of the story. That is true. Yes, he came for us. It was a time and historical place and moment and all of those events are accurate and rec- and they're true. But I think there's a sense in which he continues to go searching for us by his spirit, even though he's not here physically. There's a great deal of vulnerability, isn't there, with lost sheep? I mean, other animals could well get lost, and you might not be so worried about them because they could look after themselves. But sheep can't. Not only can they not really look after themselves, but they're very, very vulnerable to danger, to predators. I mean, what can a sheep do to protect itself? Very, very little. I think that the Lord Jesus knows how little we can do for ourselves. The Bible actually puts it this way. It says, without me, Jesus says, you can do nothing. And so we really are dependent upon the Lord to seek us and to find us. And isn't it wonderful just to see the ownership that the shepherd has for his sheep? There's a great sense of joy. I love this picture. And when he finds it, he joyfully puts it on his shoulders and goes home. And then he calls his friends and neighbours together and says, Rejoice with me, I have found my sheep. Some of the old writers, and I quote here from, from Charles Spurgeon, put it this way, In his incarnation he came after the lost sheep. In his life he continued to seek it. And in his death he laid it upon his shoulders. His, in his resurrection he bore it on its way. And in his ascension he brought it home rejoicing. Well, it's a nice way to think of the ministry of the Lord and how all the different aspects of his ministry affect you and I in some way. So what a lovely picture this is for you and I today. As we go on our little walk, as we look across and see the sheep on the hillside, maybe they're safe today, but it reminds us of how our Saviour has gone to look for us and how precious we are The thought struck me that if we were precious for Jesus to save us and having loved us and gave his life for us, and as that's the way the New Testament tells us in John 10, that the the good shepherd has laid down his life for us, then why should he now forget us? Why should he now not care for us when we are in the present situations of our lives we find? Do you think he still doesn't rejoice over you? Do you think he's not aware of your personal situation? Of course he is. He doesn't love you any less. In fact, he loves you more and more. He is so invested in each one of his children. There was another little contrast in this that struck me, and it was this fact that the sheep were not at all thinking of the shepherd. (laughs) Oftentimes lost things just wander away. And of course, that's the picture of the shepherd, of the sheep in the, in the Bible, that all we like sheep have gone astray. There's a sense, isn't there, in which we're not really looking for Jesus, but he was certainly looking for us. This really highlights the marvel and the wonder of the shepherd's care. Just recently, I was listening on one of the BBC signs, it's Outlook, and it was the story about one of those marvellous uh, uh, cellists in the world. Her name is Christine Vilvesk. I hope that's properly pronounced, but she's a world-famous cellist. And way back in 1978, from her, her father's shop, and he was an, a really exceptionally gifted, um, un, he could understand, he knew a true instrument, and he had one of his cellos was stolen. It was a Bernardelle made in... 1834 for a little countess, and the name actually was put inside it, the little countess. It was stolen, and for 36 years they searched for that cello. And one day they got word, she got an email one day from a family 
who had rented it because you couldn't necessarily afford to buy this cello. They had rented it to, that their daughter might learn the cello. And she discovered her cello was found. And, and the whole story is there. I could just encourage you if you want to go on to BBC Sounds and you'll find it there if you follow through the lost cello. But I was thinking about how this... The, the, the joy that this brought to this dear woman, and she was a world-famous cellist. This was a, a cello that had been in the family, and it was now going to be given to her daughter, which she wasn't able to do. But the family who let her know that they'd rented it had got it for their six-year-old daughter. And as a result of this, Christine said, well, I would like you to have it until you have outgrown it. Not only that, I will teach you how to play it. Well, this little girl is now going to become another world famous cellist. It's a great story. It's a very inspirational story. Christine says she never stopped praying. Interesting. For that she would find her cello. Well, you and I, if we know the Lord, we are more precious than anyone's cello. We are precious beyond what we could ever comprehend, and I hope that that will encourage you today. And if you maybe don't know the Lord, then might his love for you so intense as this be such a wonderful encouragement to you to trust him, to believe if someone loves this much, you can entrust yourself to him completely and fully. So we'll pause there on our walk. We'll pick it up tomorrow, and we'll go a little further and see what we might see. God bless.